Yeah, I've got I've got a ton of questions actually. <laughs> They're quite uh, quite related to that. Maybe this there's a very quick one, which is um the, from from NY Minute or Minute, <laughs> which is um is, is there any evidence of them using fire to cook food? Oh yeah 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 no loads um food. yeah definitely um roasting meat's not actually like the most efficient way to cook it um you can boiling is better and it does there is some evidence that they did boil things um but they're definitely i mean they they could control fire and um, i think they could produce fire no problem some people dispute that but i think the evidence is pretty good um and yes yeah, certainly they were um not everywhere necessarily um but certainly they were able to cook food for sure yeah and then from dustin uh, seal um which we've touched on but is there any evidence around whether they had any form of form of religion or at least beliefs about afterlife i suppose it relates back to what i mentioned yeah um burial. yeah i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that there's any evidence for like a formal spiritual like understanding i mean that's incredibly hard to see with the evidence that that we have um what i would say is that there looks to be pretty solid and growing evidence that they were interested in the dead um so there's been you know decades of of debate over or oh, did they bury their dead um because that's how we think treating the dead should be done now um but if you look at what they actually were doing there are some cases um where it does look as if there is a body um that was in some kind of pit whether it was natural or not um but there's also a ton of other stuff there are a lot of complete or unmessed around with skeletons more many more than you would see in sort of animal dens of, of a similar period that it's just a phenomenon that is there and especially with like newborn babies some of those are really complete and it's very hard to explain how that happens without it being covered you know people have said oh well, maybe they just froze or you know and that was why predators didn't come and scavenge them but that in that case you would expect to see more frozen animals as well and you, you just don't so there's something going on with deposition of whole bodies not laid out straight in a grave like we would imagine um, but there is something happening but also there's this whole other thing that we've only really recently sort of recognized which is that Neanderthals seem in some places um, to have been processing bodies so basically butchering them um, there is some evidence that they were eating them um, but it's not always entirely clear like in some places we have literal tooth marks um, and burning on the bones and generally the bodies are very processed like they're actually smashing the bones for marrow just like they do with animals but if you look at the the detail in some places it looks as if they are more intensively taking those bodies apart or there's more focus on the skull and, and like the, the percentage of cut marks is greater than in the animals in the site so there are hints that there's something else happening and for me i think that that's sort of you know begging the question of us to to be a bit more imaginative and to look at what people all over the world do and have done with the dead there is a massive diversity in what people do with the bodies of the dead as a means of processing the massive emotional trauma that that happens when somebody's lost and and everything that we see about neanderthals everything we know about primates and apes tells us that neanderthals were living in groups with very close emotional bonds and um, extremely um sort of social just like us and and, and hunter gathering communities have been for, for tens of millennia um so when somebody dies especially in an unexpected way um it's a it's a rupture you know it's a massive thing and we can look at what happens in um, chimpanzee and bonobo so pygmy chimpanzee um societies and it's just huge they are obsessed with the body and um, they'll stay with it for hours they're really into touching it and doing things so i understand that the there are arguments that the cannibalism or the body processing is to do with people starving basically the adults being starved but 
there's not great evidence for that most of the time they had a lot of animals we can see they are hunting animals around at the same time so i think it's more to do with a a response that if you are if if you deal with animal bodies all the time and what you do with animal bodies is you take them apart and consume them well that is potentially a way of managing grief um that we would we would sort of see um i don't know if you know there was the same physical expression of grief but there is clearly an interest in bodies so that's probably the furthest that i would say in terms of any kind of religious interest in the dead but what they were doing in terms of aesthetics and marking bones as well there is there's evidence that they were marking um animal bones sometimes in in sort of sequences of little marks and um, there's a one neanderthal skull that's marked like that and then there's also a really strange site in france where they've made huge rings of stalagmites um, nobody knows what's going on with that that's a very recent um discovery and that is really very strange um it's nearly you know it's not far off architecture how that's put together all, all these pieces of stalagmite are stacked and things so that probably for me is is the closest that i would come to talking about any kind of spiritual thing um but i wouldn't want to use that word i guess it would be more like a, a an urge to create something but we don't know why well yeah i mean they're actually um I just say to Zara, you've asked two questions now, and I'll ask one of your questions in a minute, but they're just related to that. There's one from Alexa Robinson uh, about the, the paintings, and I'll pronounce it wrong, but the Cueva de los Aviones. Aviones, yeah. Um, is there any evidence that those paintings are, are they considered aesthetic or for a more practical reason? There's also another question actually from Fiona Power, did Neanderthals make cave art, which you, you touched on there. Yeah, um, there was a really recent um, uh, study that has found some caves in Iberia, so and three sites, where <clears throat> the calcite deposits either over some red pigment or next to it were dated. And those dates came out for um, some of them as over 40,000, over 50,000, over 60,000. So as far as we are aware, it's only Neanderthals in Iberia at that time, which implies that they're responsible. However, there's the handprint, is that the case? Yeah, there's, there's a hand negative. Um, the problem is, is that um, the, the difficulty of dating that material is is one issue because um, <clears throat> if you have like a, a layer of calcite um, that's that's very flat and it's not been sort of exposed um, to, to the cave and no water has gone over it and stuff that's one thing but when you have sort of like bobbly layers of calcite and you're not quite sure if the the calcite was ever sort of exposed and it, it can affect the dating basically so there are um, there are definite uh, concerns from some uh, other dating specialists as to whether those dates are reliable or not. And I think people would like to see um, reproduction of those results because within those caves, they are really anomalous. The caves themselves have a load of other red pigment and it fits stylistically what we expect for much later Homo sapiens people, um, you know, just the normal cave painting. It's an intriguing idea that there may be a layer beneath the Upper Paleolithic art that is older. I'm not opposed to the idea. I would like to see the dating better sort of shown. But in a sense, you don't really need that because what we see from from the pigment use, but also then what I said in terms of that there are several sites where we have sort of a clear interest in making marks on bones it's not conceptually that different what i would i guess be amazed to see is that they were responsible for representational art like if there was a you know a, a clearly shown with with no worries or quibbles about dating or anything and it was a painting of an animal i think that would be absolutely mind-blowing for all Neanderthal specialists. I think wherever you stand on the aesthetic debate, I think that would be pretty amazing. But I mean, the notion that they might make a handprint, 
that's 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 possible it's interesting they saw their own handprints we have sites where we have footprints and even a handprint actually from a, a french site um, it's it's an ancient dune area from although the sea had receded and um, they were living on the sand dunes and it's it's a child's handprint just in the sand it's just perfect and mm. um, so they they would have known that as a symbol of their own bodies but but did they then have an interest in creating that symbol somewhere else i don't know mm. but yeah no Zara's question, which is uh, about, because we overlapped, we, we're coming towards the end, I suppose. So there is, of course, I think everyone knows that the, there is a, a Neanderthal DNA in all of us, yeah. <laughs> which is the way you, one of the ways you end the book. And it's, it's wonderfully, a wonderful notion. But um, just before we talk about that, specifically, Zara asked whether there's evidence of cultural or technological exchange between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, given that they lived at the same time as well as the other exchange we're going to talk about. In a, in a <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the question. If, you, if, if you're making babies, what else are you yeah. making together? <laughs> um, for me, at the moment, most of the DNA um, evidence um, that we have in terms of uh, saying when these interbreeding encounters took place, they're pretty old, you know, they're 55,000 years or older. The only evidence that we clearly have for late interactions um, comes from a Romanian uh, jawbone of a Homo sapiens, what we believe is a Homo sapiens person, um, and their DNA <clears throat> appears to show that um, they had a Neanderthal uh, ancestor within something like four to six generations, which is really, you know, it's like the time between us and when the antitals were first found is very recent um so that would imply that if that is correctly dated that there was very late interbreeding around 40,000 ish um but in terms of evidence for cultural contact that is a really fraught question um the earliest that we know um homo sapiens people were entering into europe is only sort of 40 41 42 ish which is around the time the neanderthals disappear obviously um there are some what i call in the book um sort of um intermediate cultures literally because they are found in between in the layers we have the upper paleolithic so that's the classic homo sapiens uh, cultures then we have these other things then we have the last Neanderthal-like cultures. And so the question is, who made this thing in the middle? But also, what does it look like? And for a long time, it appeared to also be culturally intermediate. It seemed to have, like that. I'm saying it, there's different versions of it in France, in Italy, in different regions. Um, it seemed to have some things that looked a bit like the Neanderthal way of doing things, Neanderthal technology, and some things that looked as if they might be like later upper paleolithic people how they did stuff so it appeared like it really was a mix like a hybrid culture the problem is is that many of those sites um are uh, were dug a long time ago and there is evidence that there was mixing of layers it's not entirely sort of um you know completely pucker in terms of being undisturbed um the sites where there is evidence genetic evidence that there was uh, Neanderthal bones in those intermediate layers. There's only two sites with that, and they are some of these problematic ones. The sites that have been more recently excavated in clean contexts, um, where there's no evidence at all of mixing, those intermediate cultures that come between the Neanderthals and the later stuff, they do not look like Neanderthals in cultural terms. They don't have any of those sort of more um, more ancient uh, technological sort of characters about them. So for me, at the moment, it's not looking like we have any clear cultural hybrids at all. Um, and in a way that kind of matches the genetics because although we have, you know, more and more cases um, of fossils where we can say oh yes this is pointing to some interbreeding happening at this time in the past or this time or really old and um, what we don't really see evidence for is like a full-on assimilation in genetic terms um of you know that we totally absorb them um i don't think that's what we see so um 
I think the encounters, if they happened um, regularly, um, or sorry, and I say that the wrong way, I don't think they happened regularly in terms of being frequent. I think they did happen regularly through time. Um, but that probably means that there was no real context for groups living together, which is what you really would need for like a proper cultural hybrid. Mm. So, so there's that, there, that what we call, well, we, we, we have Neanderthal DNA in each of us now, but that you say that's coming from occasional encounters. So we didn't live. Yes. Alone. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah, I think that's what it is. It doesn't look like overall that there was like entire populations being absorbed by Homo sapiens. It doesn't really look like that. And also we can't see in any of the late Neanderthal genetic samples we have, there's no evidence for us, our genetic material coming in late on. So that's a strange um, thing. That might just be to do with sample numbers, but but it, it's what's an interesting question is, yeah, who did who did the hybrid babies live with? Who did they stay with? Um, and it may be that it tended to be more that they stayed with us, but um, but strangely, the the source population for the Neanderthal DNA in living people, we haven't actually found sort of the fossil sort of population for that we, we know it looks a bit different to all of the neanderthals that we've sampled so far so that's an interesting question as to saying where did that happen in geographic terms as well well i think we're just about out of time um i i'm just looking if there's any more quite a lot of questions actually but um uh, well maybe it just a very quick one from peter roper that just come in which is is there a well, the question is, is there a manifestation of Neanderthal DNA in the appearance of people living today? There is some hint of that. Um, if we look at um, particular things to do with um, sort of the, the shape of the head, I think there's been hints of that. But it's difficult because, you know, we, we're still getting to grips with exactly how our own genetic recipe works. And, and it's, it's a complex process and it's it's sort of impacted by a lot of different environmental factors too but there are um possibilities that um uh some of the things that that gross sort of skull structure and things might be impacted but it's going to be expressed differently in different people because of their own um sort of genetic uh, character and also we think that um although there's quite a lot of the neanderthal genome in existence it's not the same material between different living populations of people they have different bits of it as well hmm. so i think yeah to, to to summarize then to bring this to a close um i was thinking of the last question and um uh you know we, we've talked a bit you, you've said really the, the question that's on everybody's mind often which is why did they disappear and the answer is roughly we don't know i suppose isn't it so, <laughs> but, uh, I, so i thought i might ask you what you've partly answered it what what, what would you really like to know you, you did say about about the art you'd love to see representational art. i'd like to know yeah i'd like to know about that um, I, think it, I suppose the, the the way i want to frame it is one of the things I, I liked about your book is you framed it as a as a culture almost you, you almost referred to it as a a, a a civilization that spanned this vast geographical area so i, I suppose maybe to summarize how, how do you how do you characterize them? Just a very brief characterization. Um, and also that, that question about what would be, what would be wonderful to find out about them? Um, <clears throat> I think, I guess I would, I would characterize them. I'd say that they were not a civilization, you know, like we, we t I've talked the whole time, oh, the Neanderthals, this, the Neanderthals, that, but they were so diverse because they lived across a huge area and through a massive span of time. So I think, people should remember that Neanderthals in Wales are not going to have the same life experience as Neanderthals in Palestine or in Central Asia or in Siberia. And all those different groups also would have experienced things massively differently because they lived through multiple cycles of climate change. So I think wherever they are and whatever the environment's like for them, what we do tend to see is that they are they're really successful at what they're doing you know um the question of sort of were we more successful or not well you know quite a lot of the very early homo sapiens lineages genetically are pretty much extinct so 
you know that the question of how successful we are is an open one but in terms of them they they did um they were flexible you know they were adaptable they were flexible they saw what was around them and they they took the best and they were yeah i think they were they were skillful and they were completely living full hunter gatherer lives you know in in that sense so i think that's how i would characterize them that they were very successful in their world um what would i like to to find well sort of easily i would like to have a frozen the ant's whole body um you know like people have probably heard of the Ertzi, the ice man from the alps and um, that like fired my imagination as a child you know with archaeology i remember that find and what we know we're missing with Neanderthals and we get these hints with like the wooden spears and other stuff I've not even talked about, you know, those wooden platters from a site in Spain and, and birch tar hafted objects. We know there was this massive sort of realm of organic technologies. And I would love to sort of see what did the average Neanderthal just carry around with them? What did they have on them? You know, what was their, their clothing like? Did they have pockets? <laughs> you know, what did they have in their bag? Did they have bags? You know, so that kind of thing. I would like a permafrost Neanderthal, please. I suppose, that, I suppose there is a good chance that there are such bodies around. Well, that is, yes. I mean, you know, the, the reason why we have all these bodies of, of Pleistocene, you know, lion cubs and wolves and bears, why they're, they're all emerging. The reason why is is awful reason because of the climate breakdown. Mm. But yeah, I mean, you can't help but wonder um, if there isn't something going to turn up somewhere in Siberia um, at some point. It's, yeah. it's, it's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I, I could talk forever, but we've gone over already. So it's just <laughs> a real pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for for listening i noticed yeah, thank you. you all you all stayed for the whole day but you must have been <laughs> interested um if you haven't got the book to buy the book because it's terrific so, uh, <laughs> but thank thank you thank you rebecca that's thanks very much everyone